Ray felt alarmed when he saw this. What is this? Apparently his daughter Christina is a representative of the organization. Do we want to talk to you about your mother? Ray looked at his wife, but his face expressed nothing. He hoped with all his might that it wasn't what he thought. He turned to his daughter. Where is mom? Mom told me about Luke. She did it, didn't she? Ray asked with obvious disbelief in his voice. Yes, and your problem. Ray simply looked at his wife, amazed that she would share such personal information with anyone, let alone his children and grandchildren. My problem is that none of this really concerns you. But the mother's happiness is our business? What does happiness have to do with you, Mom? Do I think that my happiness doesn't matter and that I'll have to give up everything I enjoy? Christina sighed and said, But Mommy has needs that you can't satisfy. If you have needs that she can't satisfy, do you think she'll stop you? For the first time since the beginning of the story, Josie stood up and suddenly noticed something on the table that interested her. When he did, he said, Christine, stop. Everyone looked at her, then at me, and I started laughing. Oh, Kristen, I think you've made the biggest mistake ever. I asked him, do you want to hear a funny story? Josie sat up and screamed, Ray, don't do this. But I laughed and said, that's your problem. You have to deal with it. Christina, when you were born, your mother stopped having sex. For almost three years, she could not provide for me. He even wrote me a letter about it, which I have here. This letter, this. I took a sharp step and pulled the letter out of my breast pocket. I kept it in my sock drawer all these years because it felt good to sacrifice part of my life for the love and happiness of my wife. Now I want to see my wife cringe at the hypocrisy of her own words when I quote them directly from her written words. Ray, I know you have needs, but I can't meet them right now. It would be easy for you to find a woman who can do this, but if you do, you will cause me great pain. Our marriage will not change. Survive. I'm begging you, no, I'm begging you, please don't give up on our marriage. When the depression passes, you will have to put your needs aside. I don't know how long it will take. Long, but I hope so. Please, be faithful to me, because even if the roles were reversed, I would be faithful to you. So we haven't had sex for almost three years. Three years later, we had sex one day, and it turned out to be Leo. For another four years, there was little sex, once every two months, if you were lucky. Our sex life is like this. Back to normal. So Christina, your mother and I barely had sex in seven years, and I didn't look beyond our marriage. Was I a devoted husband or an idiot? The question hangs in the air like an unpleasant odor. Josie's face turned red, half from humiliation and half from anger. I know she doesn't like dating because she always thinks I should give her more than she gives me. Christina was a little unbalanced, but still calmed down. Dad, it was a long time ago. You may never recover from this, so mom may never experience anything like this again. I looked at Eric and said, I know Kristen is going through a similar dry spell. If I were you, I'd go to hell with everything that moves. Because in 20 years, it'll be stuck on your body too. Christina blushed and asked, Who told you that? I simply said, A few weeks ago, your mother told me that you had the same problem as her. I guess you don't mind if Eric's needs are met. As Christina stuttered and gurgled, I looked at Rebecca and asked, How's your sex life? When you're going through a drought, should Leo go out and do his best to compete? I looked at the many angry faces, smiled, and said, You all seem happy to be served, but you are not happy to be in my place. Kristen came up to me and said, This is completely different. Mom needs it, but you can't do it. Accept it. I looked at them all and said, Goodbye. I turned and headed towards the door. Julie and Allison shouted at me, What's wrong with the fireworks? I replied, I've had enough fireworks today. Go and enjoy yourself. I doubt my presence will ruin everyone's fun. I went there and got into the car. Josie stood at the door as I pulled out of the driveway, but she didn't stop me. I drove, not knowing what to do. After all, today is a national holiday and everything is closed. One day my phone rang and it was Rebecca's number. She leaves a voicemail saying she regrets the ambush and that she and Leo believe it was a mistake, but Kristen essentially blackmails her into accepting it. About 30 minutes later, I found myself outside the office, so I drove, parked, and went inside. At least I'll have a cup of real coffee. Josie gave me decaf, and I hated it. Sitting at my desk, I decided to write down a list of options. Without thinking twice, the first word on the list was divorce. I don't know why it's here, right in front of me. I sat down to have coffee, thought about this word, and realized that if I want to be true to myself, I have no other choice. I no longer needed her. 
but when the roles changed, she refused. Even if she was mysterious, everyone would know, but I just couldn't live like that. No, this is a scam. And then, the words residence and divorce lawyer magically appeared on the page. I turned on the computer and googled divorce lawyer. The results page is displayed. At the top of another page was a name I recognized. Lindsay Logan. She helped me break up with a golfer I met through a charity we both support. She's young, attractive, but that makes her easier to recognize. And when the situation calls for it, she's a bull in a china shop. I visited their website and filled out the booking request form. I received an automated email saying I would be called back within 24 hours to schedule an appointment. So where should I live? I can't live alone. I don't know how to cook, clean, or do laundry, but I don't want to go to a nursing home. While thinking about this, I remembered an ad I saw. This is a shelter for the elderly located on the other side of town. It's aimed at recently divorced people who need exactly what I need, a housekeeper. Everyone has their own apartment. The front door leads to the car park and the back door leads to the complex, which contains a small restaurant offering catering, laundry, cleaning, and ironing, as well as an apartment cleaning house. After searching on Google, I found the facility's phone number. I rang the doorbell, having forgotten the day, but was surprised when the call was answered. Apparently, the manager or assistant manager was on site 24-7 and happy to show me around at any time. I asked if I could come now, and the answer was, sure, why not? The journey from the office to the venue takes approximately 45 minutes, mainly due to road closures due to fireworks. The manager showed me the building and the apartment for rent. To my surprise, I knew two of the residents, and they invited me to watch the game with them in the main hall. I had a great time with old friends and new ones. I even managed to drink beer. After the game, Sam, who I went fishing with before we got married and lost touch, asked me why I was there. I said, this woman has decided she needs a younger model and she doesn't understand why I'm upset. Sam looked at me and said, Josie was a selfish bitch, but this is cooler than I thought. I asked him with a surprised look, do you know her? Sam made a strange face and said, of course I'm friends with your brother. We met her when we were 12. Six weeks were a lifetime. We lived in the same area until we were 10 years old. Five years. I was surprised and said, I don't know, I don't know. You spent the night in Mountain View while we were fishing. Yeah, Sam replied. My parents moved there before we met. And then when you and Josie moved, we lost touch. I don't think she would want you near me, would let you get away from me. If you remember, you are here. You were always away on the weekends when the boys were away and stuff. You've lost touch with all the boys. Now tell me how many of your friends were your friends before you met Josie, and how many of them were Josie's friends when you met her? This is an interesting question, and I immediately knew the answer. No. It was a shock, but it wasn't. I always do something to make her happy, and when her happiness conflicts with mine, she always wins. What happened to Luke was the extreme manifestation of the selfishness. I went to the manager's office and said that I accepted the apartment. We finished the paperwork and I took out my deposit card. The manager took one look and said, I think you should open a new account before you pay me. You don't want your soon-to-be ex-wife to know where you are. I didn't even think about banks, phone calls, etc. He suggested that I open an account in a new bank tomorrow. He looked at my phone and said, update this block too. You need a smartphone for banking and social applications. When he smiles and says, don't worry, spend a week here and you'll look at your smartphone like an old friend. I was driving home and saw an empty house. The fireworks had already ended, so I knew that around 10.30 they would open the stands and go home. That gave me 45 minutes. I walked into the office and collected all the financial information the attorney had requested in the automated email. I've archived everything, so it's easy to copy everything. I loaded everything into the car and sat down while the others ran to the doors. Everyone stopped and looked at me as if I had just popped a balloon. Kristen turned and said, everybody go home. Mom and I would do this with dad. The others were eager to leave the house, leaving Josie and Kristen at the door, watching me, and I sat in a chair, watching them. Josie started telling me, why are you bringing up everyone's personal problems? They are personal, and this letter is written from the heart. It hurts my heart that you would use this against me. Kristen added, you ruined a perfect day with your nonsense and then stormed off like a petulant child. I didn't move or speak, I just looked at her. Finally, Josie screamed, 
What are you talking about? We need to apologize, and then I want you to call Luke and tell him there are too many people in line for body bags. I started talking to Josie and said, We're done. If he ever comes back to this house, we will get a divorce. Now, before I say anything she might regret, I'm going to give my daughter a reason to leave this house. Christina looked at me with disgust in her eyes and said, There will be no divorce. Now try to heal your wounded pride. If I hear you attacking Luke, you will never see your grandson. I stood up and walked towards Kristen with the intention of scaring her. It was clear that my expression frightened her because she took a few steps back as my anger flared. Josie stepped between us and said, Christina, let's go. I will take care of your father. As Kristen quickly left the house, Josie said, How dare you threaten your daughter like that? I went upstairs and said, I'm moving into the guest room. I'm tired of being in the same room with you. Sleeping in the same bed was out of the question. I moved a few things into the guest room and closed the door. Josie opened the door with the spare key, but I stood in the doorway and said, If you don't leave, I'll throw you out of this room. There was an expression of surprise and shock on his face, but he took a step back and I immediately slammed the door in his face. Overall, I slept pretty well and was up the next morning before Josie was up. My first stop was the office, where I took a few days off. I explained what happened to my boss and he advised me to take a week off, but not to use my vacation entitlement. The next morning at 9 o'clock, I received a call from the law firm with an appointment for 2.30. PM, I accepted the deadline and went to the bank to open a new account. The bank representative showed me how the banking app works, and I found it very simple. I'm ready to transfer half of the money to my new account. Then I went to the mall and bought a new phone and a contract. I returned to the bank and they installed the mobile banking app. I then went to the nursing home and paid the deposit through the banking app. From there, I went to a furniture store and ordered a new bed, furniture, TV, etc. for my new apartment and I asked for them to be delivered to the apartment by Wednesday. I also bought two large suitcases from a nearby store. At half past three, I was sitting in front of the office of my future lawyer. The receptionist let me in, and when I entered her office, I was shocked. I always remembered Lindsay as attractive, but she was just a vision in front of me. She looked up and smiled. I said, you've changed since we last spoke. The smile turned into laughter. I am 15 years old. I hope I've changed and I hope it gets better. I couldn't help but laugh and said, I bet. Apparently, he didn't remember that I was at the charity event he was going to dress up for. The following meetings were entirely devoted to business. I told him what happened and gave him all the financial information. The offer was that she would keep the house, half her savings, and receive $500 a month in spousal support for two years. I would have kept my pension, and she would have been allowed to continue working. The documents could have been delivered the following Friday, but I asked for them to be delivered on Saturday morning. I returned home at the usual time and ignored Josie. I moved everything into the guest room and packed my new suitcase while she wasn't looking. The next morning, I carried them to the car and left before she woke up. I left my suitcase in the apartment. I throw away furniture as soon as it arrives. At my old house, I only had a week's supply of clothes left, plus all this dirty stuff. After checking a few things, I went to the office. The manager asked me what I was doing there. I have nothing else to do, so I might as well do some work. I was actually having a very productive day and found myself about an hour later than usual after eating at the grocery store near my office. I returned home an hour later. Josie looked at me and said, I cooked lamb and it turned out bad. Why are you late? I just looked at her and said, okay, and went to the guest room and closed the door. I heard Josie knock on the door. We need to talk. This cannot continue. I opened the door and said, stop it, Sherlock. I can't stand the way you cheat on me every weekend. Nothing will change until it's over. Her face turned red and she screamed, no respect for my feelings, my needs, or my happiness. You need to behave and work on this marriage, otherwise it will go down in history. I started laughing. I think you need to look in the mirror and say something like that, because you definitely don't respect my feelings, my needs, and my happiness. Now leave me alone. The rest of the week passed in silence. Last Thursday, after vacation, I went to pack my things because new furniture had arrived. I also went out and bought new bedding and other essentials. Last Friday, I put all my dirty clothes in bags and took them to my new home to wash. I got up Saturday morning and put the rest of my clothes and medications in the bag I carry with me when I play golf. Then I went down. Josie sat down at the table and said, If it rains on your golf course, don't come home until 10 o'clock so you don't see anything you don't want to see. This is true. You don't care about my feelings. You're going to move on with this guy, Luke, and I have nothing to do with your plans. She looked at me with a sad smile and said, 
you are the most important thing, but you can't take care of this part of my life, so I need someone to help me. I woke up. Okay, you made your choice, and I made mine. I walked up to the door, and she said, What, no kiss? I turned to her and smiled. Never. I drove to Lindsay's office, met her and the lawyer there, and then drove the lawyer's car back to my old house. We parked a few doors away from the house and waited. Sure enough, Luke pulled into the driveway around 7.30 p.m. At a quarter past nine, the lawyer came to the door. It took Josie a few minutes to respond, and it was obvious from the way they were dressed that they weren't wasting any time. I saw the lawyer talking to her. She nodded, then took an envelope out of her pocket and handed it to him. She refused to accept it. He spoke to her again, and this time she took the envelope. When she left, I saw Josie open the envelope, put her hand to her mouth, and close the door. Less than five minutes later, Luke left the house and left. The first call came from Christina and sounded ten minutes later. When I answered the phone, I heard someone shout, What nonsense! My mom is divorced. What's the point of being kind to myself? I let Kristen talk until the phone went silent. I sat there for another thirty seconds and then asked, Are you ready? This caused another stream of curse words and I just let him go. Finally, he stopped and asked, Huh? My answer, Hmm, yes, what? Made him hang up. Lindsay and I filled out the final paperwork and sent it to Josie's lawyer. I also gave Lindsay limited power of attorney and authority to act on my behalf if I was unable to appear. As I was leaving, I saw Leo parked outside Lindsay's office. He looked at me and said, We're all looking for your car. I'm here to take you home and tell you to stop being stupid. I walked past him and started to get into my car. But as I approached the door, he put his hand out to stop me from opening the door and said, Get in my car now. I didn't move. I just said, if you don't move your hands now. At that moment, Lindsay came up behind Leo, put her hand on his shoulder and said, my client wanted to leave, but you stopped him. If you don't get in their way, I'll make sure you spend the money. The landscape awaits 30 days of false imprisonment, and you will not like it because you are too beautiful to spend 30 days in this area. Leo's hand left the car door in an instant, and I opened the door and sat down. Entering the car, Leo said, Dad, this is not the end. Mom, you don't get a divorce and don't leave home. Lindsay looked at me and said, I doubt there will be chaos, and then went back to the office. I got into the car and drove to my house, trying to park where I couldn't be seen from the street. On Sunday, I met with my housekeeper and we discussed my medications, dietary needs, and other plans for my heart condition. They have a system in place to ensure all medications are taken and meals meet all nutritional needs. It all happened on Monday afternoon. Lindsay called me and told me that Josie had hired a lawyer and that her first action was to file a protective order stating that I was unable to take care of myself and that the court had ordered me to be placed in the custody of another person, guardian, Josie and Kirsten, for helping me cope with my heart condition. A preliminary hearing is scheduled for 10 a.m. Lindsay asked for information about my doctor and the director of the center to prepare her defense. The next morning at 10 o'clock, the hearing took place as scheduled. Josie's lawyer stood up and said, I can't take care of myself. Josie has complete control over my health and she should be the one taking care of me. Josie was called as a witness and gave a very one-sided assessment of my inability to do anything for myself. Things got worse when Lindsay asked her what she would do with the divorce petition if the order was granted, to which Josie replied, Canceled, of course. Lindsay then turned to the judge and said, Your Honor, this is an attempt to avoid a divorce. This has nothing to do with my client's well-being, before sitting down. Lindsay then called the facility manager, who explained that it was an assisted living facility and that there was a system in place to ensure nutritional and medical needs were met. Then she called my doctor and he described the whole procedure in detail and said that everything was as good as he had ever seen and there were no problems. The judge looked at Josie's lawyer and sued him. After a heated discussion, the judge said, I will not make this decision because it is clear that the health reasons given are false and the real reason is to try to prevent a divorce. They will all be fired. After we left, the doctor turned to me and said, Call me. I looked at your medication chart and I think we need to reconsider this. Kirsten stood behind Lindsay and when the doctor left, said, Dad, this is not the end. You need to get over yourself and go back to your mother. Otherwise, she will be angry with you and sign these papers. I laughed and said, go ahead, let her do it, and quickly. 
The next day, I was sitting in the doctor's office, and he said to me, I noticed that you always take a very high dose of ACE, causing your blood pressure to become too low. I think we need to work together to achieve. The last time you checked yourself, your blood pressure was too low. Starting today, I would like to reduce the dose by 10 milligrams per week. I will send this letter to Mrs. Davidson at her new address. Over the next two months, my blood pressure medications dropped to zero. About two weeks after the last photo, Sam and I were watching TV when the manager brought in a woman who wanted to rent an apartment. I immediately found her attractive, but the slight movement in my pants was a strange, uncomfortable, but very pleasant sensation, a feeling I haven't felt in a long time. After Chow Shi tried her best to prevent this, the first divorce hearing finally took place. Lindsay characterized the petition as a simple, irreconcilable divorce and demanded immediate approval. Josie's lawyer stood up and said that the divorce was a misunderstanding on my part and asked for 12 consultations, the most in our state, so that we could sort things out and find a solution. The judge looked at Lindsay and said, your client has been married for a long time and I think he should see if he can salvage anything. He later said in the courtroom, I'm going to schedule three consultations and then one consultation. I will keep you updated with progress reports. The consultants must come to an agreement. The decision to seek help from a psychologist is painful. Josie's first suggestion was to hire a friend from her golf club. But this quickly backfired and we ended up choosing a consultant who Lindsay knew would be impartial. The first session was terrible from the start. Josie initially said that she had needs and that it would be unwise for me to interfere with her treatment. When I explained to her that this was cheating, she panicked and said that it was just a necessity and that I was not up to the task and how could I expect her to remain faithful in this situation? When I showed her the letter I was trying to get from the counselor and told her it didn't matter, the counselor confused her and said he clearly didn't think marriage was equal. The second hearing was even worse when Kirsten bargained mid-trial, demanded the lawyer stop being selfish, and told the judge to stop the divorce. After the second trial, the lawyer wrote to the judge that there was no need to continue the case since there was no hope of saving the marriage. Over the next three months, Josie's lawyer used every procedural means at his disposal to delay the divorce. I requested medical and psychiatric evaluations, claiming that I was mentally unstable and that my medications prevented me from making rational decisions. The last hearing in the Ave Maria case took place two days before the last hearing. I was deemed competent to make my own decisions, and Lindsay asked the court to make this hearing final, a request that can be granted. One evening after dinner, I was sitting in the main building chatting with new resident Angela, whose presence was causing me a stir. We became friends, and our mutual attraction grew as my pants moved. I spoke to the doctor again, and he explained that my ACE dose was too high and was causing me to be unable to pump blood to my extremities. It turns out that Josie asked to keep my medication at the highest level because she believed it would be better for my health. While we were talking, two policemen and a well-dressed man approached me and asked who I was. When I gave my name, the man handed me an envelope stating that my children had been granted temporary rights under a durable power of attorney and that I would be placed in protective custody pending a full hearing. As I was being escorted out of the building, I yelled at Angela to call my lawyer, Lindsay Logan, and ask her to come see me. I was taken to a local hospital and placed on a bed in a secure ward. About two hours later, I heard Lindsay's voice at the front desk, but was told that she had been under power of attorney orders not to see me. The next morning at nine, Lindsay and the lawyer came into my room, followed by a nurse, and said, you can't come in here. The lawyer turned, handed him a piece of paper, and said, this is the power that confirms our rights. If you interfere with me as a judicial officer, I can use any means to gain entry. Trust me, after yesterday, after what happened to him lately, I won't be nice to you. The nurse quickly stepped aside, and Lindsay came up to me and said, get up and get out of here. They will try to stop him. The lawyer untied us, and we ran out of the hospital to catch a taxi. Lindsay took me to her house, sat me down for coffee, and explained everything to me. I signed a power of attorney for my children when I had a heart attack. They have the right to make decisions about my health and finances if I become disabled. Yesterday they activated me, said that I have a developmental disability and admitted me to the hospital. They have a hearing at 10 in the morning, and if they can get me to attend, they will take over management of me and all my legal matters. Lindsay's plan was to have me appear in court, but since the children told the police that I was a danger to myself and others, we had to be careful. We left Lindsay's house at a quarter past nine, took a taxi to the courthouse, and entered through the back door. 
At 10 o'clock, the case went to trial, and when Lindsay entered the courtroom to defend herself, Kirsten's lawyer objected, saying that she had been questioned by a lawyer and could not represent me. Lindsay stood up, said, ask Mr. Mulholland yourself, and called me. The children jumped up, but the judge ordered them to sit down. I have a right to be there. Then the judge looked at me and said, you are not weak. Why do you want to file a complaint? Lindsay stood up and said, my client is divorcing his wife, and this is just an attempt to stop him. The judge looked at his documents and said, why is there no mention of divorce in these documents? This is a clear abuse of power and abandonment of the case. Miss Logan, when is the divorce hearing? She replied, in an hour. The judge looked at the children's lawyer and said, if there is any objection to the decree of divorce, you both must go to the county and remain there for 21 days. The divorce went well, and after three months, I was alone. What happened to Angela? Well, the night the divorce was finalized, we had a party, and while we were dancing, something went wrong. Before either of us knew what was happening, we were in bed making friends. We don't do it like rabbits, but caring for a heart patient once a week makes us all happy.